Life fans, George Hansen, the Pope of Pugilism. Oh, it is Christmas Eve, and instead of shopping, I'm sitting here in my Blue Horizon chair, relaxing. I'm about to have a conversation about boxing with the barrister of boxing, Ben Dowden, straight out of London. I hope you enjoyed this discussion. We're just going to talk about everything in boxing. And uh, tomorrow, we're going to have a 2020 wrap-up with Master Knowledge, or The Knowledge, the British promoter, former fighter, Spencer Ferron. So we will do that tomorrow. But since we have the time, it's Christmas Eve. We're just going to talk some boxing with Ben Dowdy. Thank the, you. Um, in the old days, you'd get a really good fighter like Colin Jones or Tony Simpson, but they weren't quite good enough to beat Marvin Hagler or Donald Curry. So they didn't quite make it. Whereas these days, we learned years ago, and the business learned years ago to to franchise world titles so they could keep them in-house. So I remember Kevin Kelly years ago saying, you Brits just fight each other and call yourselves world champions, you know. And there is an element of truth in that too. Well, you know, one of the greatest fighters I've ever seen, just just boxing, John Conte. Yeah. He's I a mean, good he friend of mine, you know. He's a beautiful boxer. Yeah, John's a friend of mine because he's he's in the recovery community too. He hasn't, he hasn't had a drink for like... Um, 35 years or something like that. And he, he, he sometimes goes to meetings and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I talk to John quite a lot. How, how did he develop like that? I mean, when you look at his boxing style, it was just so different. He said he, he credits a lot of his development to a trainer he had at the club in Liverpool called Charles Atkinson Senior. And Charles Atkinson Senior later on became a big coach in the Far East. He moved out to somewhere like Thailand or wherever, and he fostered quite a lot of the scene out there and a few champions he was involved with. Um, but he said he instilled on him the use of the left hand more than anybody else. He said, he taught me so much that I could do with that left hand, whether it was a jab or the hook. Mm -hmm. And he, be, he, just, he just gave him a great left hand. He said, if anything, I didn't throw the right hand enough. He said, but Ch Charles Atkinson Sr. knew more about the the effective use of the left hand than any coach he ever met. That was what he, so that was the guy he seemed to think shaped him. I saw Conte just box with one hand. I remember one fight he had broken his hand. I don't know if it was against Matthew Saab Muhammad or Matt yeah. Franklin at the time, but he just used one. He was throwing combinations with one hand. Yeah. It's just Which, amazing how he could jab and uppercut and hook. He was just a beautiful boxer, pure like, boxer. Like you, like, yeah, like exactly like you said. He said that first coach made him use the left hand so much he became he was able to rely on it you know man if Conte was around today he would be light heavyweight champ I think he would yeah I mean you think how would he uh Conte versus Canelo even or <laughs> Beterbiev um Vivol I think he'd be the guys yeah I, I think Conte would beat all of them for sure uh, yeah but now people want uh, like you said Bivol or Better be all, all the light heavyweight. Canelo just won a super middleweight title. And the first thing you hear in social media, well, I will be impressed if he fought this person. You know, so I went to the extreme. I said, they won't be impressed until he fights Anthony Joshua. Do people realize this is a guy coming from term pro as a junior welterweight? Well, oh, Canelo, yeah. yeah. It, he's fighting two weight divisions at super middleweight above what I think should be his real weight, 154. Yeah, well, I, mean, I think, I mean, he does look awful big these days, doesn't he? He does look awful, you know, chunky. But, I, I mean, I'd be surprised if he could make light middle anymore, but he's got like a light middleweight frame. or he, That's what that's what he was certainly starting out with. But he's he's put a lot of bulk on it, hasn't he? Uh, however, however he's, that's been achieved. He's only 5'8". <laughs> yeah, he's only 5'8", yeah. He's only 30 years old Jared as well. Hurd. Put him next to Jared Hurd and you'll see the size disparity. And Hurd is a 54-pounder. Yeah. But he's a bigger guy. I mean, I've, I've stood next to Canelo. I've, I've, I've been in a, um, a media huddle with Canelo asking like a question and stuff. And I've seen he's, he's not huge. No. Golovkin's bigger. Yes. Yes. And I think, I think they're going to make that fight a third fight with Golovkin. Uh, I saw Golovkin's last fight, and sometime I, I sit there and I listen to the ring announcers, 
they're really cheerleaders and hype men. But mm -hmm. Ben, if you sit and you look at Golovkin, you can see that his skills have diminished. He's slower. Yeah, he's not the same guy. And I honestly believe he's going to get knocked out by Canelo. He's certainly not going to get his hand raised. If he couldn't get his hand raised in, in, in 2017 or 2018, then I, I don't see how it's going to happen in 2021. You know, because the he's first fight slower. Golovkin won. The first fight Golovkin won, I don't think there's really any two ways about that. The draw didn't, I couldn't see much justification for it. But the second fight, I think it was a lot, it was a lot closer. And, and, and if people think, if some people think Canelo won it, I'm okay with that, the second fight. Yeah. But, but, but I think they should do it again. I, I look at Golovkin and you can tell when fighters have diminished. I'm not saying he's still not good, but it's not the same Triple G. Now he's throwing punches. It's like he has to think before he throws. Do you know and, what? That's what Ray Robinson said. You know what, Rob, Rob, Rob Robinson, probably in the, I don't know when he said it, but it was early. It was like 1950. He said, the public don't know it, but I do. He said, these days, he said, you have to think the punches. When, when you're young, you just did it. It would be instinctive. He said, that's when I noticed. He said, the public don't realize I'm slipping, but I know. But, but, but I can see with Golovkin, and um, I'm happy for him that he's going to get a retirement check. Yeah, I mean, he, he, he deserves it. It's not like he, yeah. he's paid his dues, he's fought everybody, don't know, but he, and he's, he's a cool guy, you know, he's a classic guy. He's, he's somebody who's, who's represented boxing well. He has. He's, he's really a great person. And yeah. there was a time when he was the boogeyman, but he's 38. And a lot of people don't know. Wow. We should remember that Marvin Hagler got out at 33. Yeah. Golovkin's 38? He, yes, yeah. he's 38, Chris. Wow. Chris, I hope you're taping. This is good stuff. I actually, I am. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Yeah, we can. This is off the cuff. That's why stuff. they pay you the big buck. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so because my reply from Spencer just maybe, I said, can you do 7 p.m. tomorrow instead? And he just said, maybe. Obviously, we need more of a commitment than that. But I guess I, I will get it. I will get it in, in, in enough time. Basically, first thing in the morning, I will get that commitment. It's, Let me ask um, a question, uh, Ben. For clarification, um, I, I I saw a video with you and Spencer, and I forgot that you you you're actually a musician. You were playing the guitar, and yeah, Spencer yeah. was doing a dance hall rap. Yeah, right. Yeah, he was yeah. doing a dance hall, and I said, "Oh my God, how did he learn it? Is he well, is his family Jamaican?" Absolutely, he he's Jamaican with a capital J. His profile. I said, "Wait up, is Spencer Jamaican?" He's very Jamaican, yeah. He's he, like yourself. He's absolutely, he's usually Jamaican I mean, and, and very proud of that heritage, yeah. I mean, so, so that's where that comes from. I mean, oh, I'm, his mom and dad, they're Jamaicans? Yeah. I mean, I, I'd never met his father who passed a few years ago, but I've met his mother um, a few times. I was at her 80th birthday, and even that was a few years ago. And uh, and there's lots of Jamaicans in the whole clique and the family. And some, mm -hmm. when I go see Spencer sometimes, He'll take me to the Jamaican barbers and then we'll go get coffee, okay. bread and patty. Know him. You know, yeah. So, yeah, he, he's he's absolutely steeped in Jamaican culture for sure. So, Spencer, you know, we, we have to call Elephant Man or Bounty Killer or Beanie Man and uh, get him on, get him a record. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's that, that, that happened because we were recording one of our shows back in 2012 when not a lot of people were doing that kind of show type format back then, to be, mm -hmm. to be honest, but a lot of people are doing it now. And um, there was a studio behind us, and it was at a gym in East London, a big gym called TKO Gym, where Jimmy Tibbs was based, Billy Joe Saunders was trying in from, from, from his pro debut. And then we were recording this show in a little room, and there was somebody, made, one of the, the, the gym owner and the, tra the kind of head trainer's son was doing some recording in the, in, in the background, and Spencer heard it and asked, could he have a go on the mic? And that's we. We just kept the camera rolling and got that. So the next the next week, I thought, well, I've got to do my thing with the guitar now because, we, you know, it's, we had... How long have you been with. playing, Ben? Say again? How long have you been playing the, the guitar? Uh, I mean, I started playing about 19. I, I picked up the guitar when I started to drift away from boxing the first time. Man. And yeah, so, I mean, I used to... I was saying to Chris when I, when I was gallivanting in the years when I first went to LA and I said, I just went because I was chasing some woman that I met in Paris, Korean girl, but I busked my way around. I, I busked on in Paris, you know, London, Paris, New York. When I lived in New York, uh, the first couple of times I would busk on the subway. And then when I started boxing again, sometimes I would play songs and busk on the subway on the F train to Gleason's 
then I'd leave the guitar in the office and I'd go spy Vivian Harris and then take Man. the guitar and busk on the way back, you know. Man, I, I noticed, I, and I got to get a copy of your book. Oh, yeah, for sure, yeah, yeah. Yep. And that and that, that that describes all of that basically, George, the lost years, because by the time I was 18, I first of all started to drift away from boxing. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was then I went on, on a tour of the States and got into what you might call bad habits and the whole kind of party in life. So my, my eye was taken off the ball, the righteous path. And then mm -hmm. then I come back in the gym in 1991. Uh, and then I got a guy wanted me to turn pro, et cetera. And I was going along with it for a while. Then I, then I decided I didn't want to do that. And I was, it was too much discipline required. And I was doing all this other stuff. So I didn't end up getting back in the ring until I was 33, when I had an amateur fight out, out in New York. At least mm -hmm. the show was at least. And so the books describe all of that period, but basically from being in, on the straight road with boxing, then going on this massive detour for about 15 years and then finding my way back into boxing, back into the ring. And then obviously the, the, the other thing, like coaching and the punditry like you do yourself, you know? Man, well, you're, you are well-traveled. You've been in New York, Gleason's gym. I mean, that's legendary. Yeah, I fought there as well. I mean, I still got a trophy. Man. If I say that, I'm gonna go get it. One second. Okay. This was um from the fight at Gleason. So as you see, Man, it's a big trophy nice. considering I didn't win. You can see there it says Gleason's amateur boxing sort of runner up, right? It's, yeah, it that's says nice. runner up when you lose. But so that's that nice was two thousand three. But it's a it's a big trophy for considering I didn't even win the fight, you know. But <laughs> but it but it was um it was a close fight. It was good to be and you know something that it's kind of cool. The kid that I boxed, it was a it was a a black kid from the from Long Island, and he he boxed um, Danny Jacobs uh, oh. in something called it wasn't the Golden Gloves, but it was another tournament out there. He boxed him in, and he lost a three two decision to Danny Jacobs. Having beat me on a on a majority split, whatever you want to call it, and he also fought Keith Thurman and Demetrius Andrade. It, it, you know, it, as an amateur, he did turn pro, but he, he boxed those three as amateurs. So I've got a little mashup of me fighting Hendrickson and then J Danny Jacobs fighting Hendrickson round mm -hmm. about the same time or within a year of each other. So that's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. Man, it's I tell you, boxing. I, I don't know what I would would do without it. I mean, it's, it's the best thing. I'm. I'm so glad we're in Philadelphia. Did you notice that um just got the news yesterday? Former WBA and WB, WBC and WBA. Frankie Randall. Yeah, Frankie died. He Sir. did. He's only fifty nine. Yeah. Um, Man. Uh, it was um, and I hear he had issues because people said he had uh, issues with substances, like yeah. a lot of people do, a lot of fighters do, and apparently he was suffering from uh, dementia and. Um, yeah. And what else? Um, Parkinson's. I think that's yeah. what they said he had. He was living in a nursing home. So, uh, yeah, he was only fifty nine. But you know, he fought on way too long. I mean, he yeah, he he, he was he was a fantastic fighter when he beat Chavez. You know, um, yes. But the Lawson on the I think he's probably, and I have to research it. He's probably the only world champion to have lost both his title because of a headbutt, Te technical decision to Chavez. Then he won the WBA from yeah. Juan Koji Martin or Kogi, Kogi, yeah. Kogi, and he lost yeah. that on, on technical decision due to a headbutt. Both, yeah, yeah. both times he lost his titles. It probably but, um, is the only time it's happened twice. Yeah, but um, man, really great fighter. It's it's unfortunate, but um, I, I know there's a lot to cover. Hopefully we can get Spencer and, and cover a lot because it, we have so many fights that we want to see. You know, I, I hope we can get a chance to discuss um, Errol Spence and Terence Crawford. Spence is going back and forth saying he's the A side and Crawford is the B side. Yeah. And I got in a long debate on social media with someone. I said, I don't know how you can call, you know, we need to, a lot of times people think A side, B side has something to do with talent, and it doesn't. A side, B side 
has a lot to do with your marketability and how many viewers you can get on pay-per-view. That's it. It's leverage. It's just leverage in a business. It's simple as yes. that, you know. If anything, it means who's who's got the unfair advantage before the bell rings. And before the bell rings. <coughs> I remember yes. um, Carl Frampton and Scott Quigg when they fought back in, what was it, 2016. They were they had a whole uh, uh, face-off where they, where they sit either side of the table. They were, uh, or maybe even it was at the press conference, they were arguing about who was the A side. They were, and you know, um, whatever what what happens to fighting men, they start arguing about stuff like that. You know, um, I'm trying to imagine Hagler and Hearns, uh, you know, bickering over who was the A side they, in the fight. They they, they they didn't argue, but you know, no. I, I had to say to someone on social media. Uh, I believe Oscar and Floyd, they split the, the individual, I didn't verify, 70-30. And they said, well, Oscar was the A side and Floyd was the B side and Floyd agreed to it. And I said, yes, you have to remember when Oscar walked out the 1992 Olympics with, with the gold medal around his neck, he was already a household name. He was a superstar. Yeah. He was. Yeah. So I can understand Floyd taking a backseat to that and then taking the fight. Um, but when we talk about Errol Spence and, and Crawford, there's not a huge disparity. No. If you put both their face on a milk carton yeah. and, and you go outside, I would argue that two out of three people would not recognize either fighter. Yeah. No, Spence is not a big star. So the, the idea that he's got this massive amount of leverage over, over uh, Crawford. No. It's not relevant. They're, that's 50-50 right down the middle in terms of... That's the way I see it. And, it. and if we want to be honest, the most accomplished fighter between the two is Terrence Crawford. He's a three-division world champion, a unified world champion in, in two other divisions or one other division. Um, I yeah. don't see any disparity between the two. Really. Some people would argue that Spence has beaten better opposition. That, that is the kind, what some people like to claim. But, um, okay, but no. really? Okay, let me ask a question. He fought uh, Mikey Garcia. Yeah. Former featherweight champ. I, I believe Mikey's about three feet, two inches tall. More or less, yeah. On tiptoes, yeah. And, and, and Mikey went the distance and you could not figure him out. Now, let, let's go back to Terrence Crawford. For the former featherweight champ, Gamboa. Yeah. Gamboa is a problem for anybody in this prime. It, it took him three, four rounds to figure him out because Gamboa won those early rounds. What did Crawford do? He stopped him. Yeah. When you can't stop a featherweight and you're saying you're the A side and you fought it as a welterweight your entire life and you let a featherweight champion go the distance with you. Um, I can't think of a featherweight champion of any era who would have lasted the distance with Tommy Hearns as a welterweight. No, I'd be struggling to, to come up with one. Or one that would have lasted with Ray Leonard. No. But, I mean, you're the A-side. If you don't want to fight, just say, I don't want to fight Terrence Crawford. Um, do I believe Crawford can beat Spence? Do I believe Spence can beat Crawford? That's why I want to see the fight. Exactly, exactly. And that's the whole point. It's hard to call. It's hard to call. That's why I want to see the fight. And we don't have enough fights like that in this era. We don't have enough fights where you literally, where you can't call it. That's why you want to watch it. You know, um, that's why I want to watch it. I believe it's a, it's a great fight, but it's not Hearns versus... Leonard or Leonard versus Benitez, but I still yeah. want to watch it. Montel Griffin said it's it's today's Tommy and Ray. That's the way he put it. Mm -hmm. he, Montel Griffin said that it's today's Leonard Hearns, basically. Um, can I can I say this? Um, that comparison is like throwing a bullet and shooting one. Yeah. That, that yeah. fight does not compare to Tommy Hearns and Sugar Ray Leonard. It's a good no, it fight. It, it really doesn't. I mean, the thing with Montel is he, he comes out with a lot of wacky stuff. Um, we were arguing today. He was saying that 
Canelo will be better than Duran when he will be greater than Duran when he's done. And you, how can you possibly call Duran the greatest Latino fighter ever when he's got 18 losses? And I was talking about Ray Robinson having 19 losses. And he said, exactly, well, he's not the greatest either, you know, because... Uh, Michael you can't... Griffin said Ray Robinson is not the greatest. Let me ask a question. Uh, he talks about Montel rubbish. Didn't Montel fight Roy Jones? Huh? Didn't Montel fight Roy Jones? Yeah, he did, yeah. Right, he, he won by a disqualification. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I'm not trying to disparage Montel in case I ever run into him in the airport. Yeah. For him, to, for him to make that comment, maybe it, it it gives credence to the fact that Roy was a devastating puncher. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah, well, he was saying because what did he say? Um, Robinson couldn't do what Canelo did. He won the World well, that Heavyweight Title. Robinson couldn't do that. And I said, well, he won a version. Robinson beat 17 undefeated world champions. Uh, yes. Sorry, undisputed. He beat 17 undisputed world champions. You know, um, the, you can't compare, you can't say he failed to do what this other guy did when 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 the goalposts have moved as much as they have, you know. But but we, we go back and forth quite a lot, me and Montel, but it's all it's all good. You know? When people start at that point, upset. Ben, when people start at that point, um, having a debate or discussion with them is a futility. Is an exercise in futility. Yeah. For someone to make that comment. Some people, some people have got their value base, you know. They, they, they think um, it's about the stats. And, the, and the, what, what, what he says in particular is this is facts. I don't talk, I don't talk, you know, emotions or I just talk facts, but you have to be able to analyze so called facts, especially in something as disingenuous as professional boxing. And you have to be able to put it in context. You have to be able to to um, compare the eras in their context, you know, on their merits and look at, you know, I've said it before, when you're evaluating greatness, it comes down to who did you fight? Who did you beat? When did you beat them? Who beat you in and around your prime, if anybody? And uh, obviously you look at the eye test and the skills and your, your own kind of judgment of how good a fight somebody looks. And yes, you, you weigh up the head to head, how would this guy have done against this guy? And obviously you have to look at longevity as well. Um, that's about it. But you've got to look at all of that, not just because, not just because you think this guy would have beat that guy. You know. Mm -hmm. I wonder how Montel would have done in today's era with no Roy Jones. I think he he would have done okay because if you look at the leading like heavyweights, you've got um, uh, you've got I mean, let's say Kovalev's gone now, so you've got Bivol, you've got Beterbiev, which everybody seems mm -hmm. to think is the man. Yeah. You've got Canelo if he wants to go to go back there. Um, so, I mean, I think Montella was good enough to compete the way he did with Roy Jones the first time. Yeah. And he beat James I, Tony. I let's, so. let's remember he beat James Tony as well. So he probably is a bit yeah, underrated true. Montel because it's all very well saying that, you know, James Tony wasn't motivated when he beat him, et cetera, et cetera. But he still beat him twice, right? Yeah. yeah so. I have to check. I, I remember him beating him the first time, um, which I couldn't believe. But um, like you said, Montel Griffin, he can fight. Yeah, he can fight. He can fight. He's a good fighter. For sure. <clears throat> but sometimes these guys who've been there at the highest level, they don't necessarily have perspective. To it, it doesn't mean they can pull rank on you. You know what I mean? But just because exactly. somebody, the casual perception will be, well, I'm sure Mont Montel Griffin would know better than you do. But, but no, that's not true. And to be fair, he never suggests that. When we get up, when we argue, he never suggests that he would know better because of his stature and because of what he achieved. He doesn't. He doesn't. Doesn't patronize like that. At least he just sticks to what he thinks. And he did say when it finished, he said, "You're my man. We can go back and forth, and nobody gets upset, which is okay. You know, mm -hmm. makes the world go round." It's like a, a, a someone from the UK commented, "Who am I to tell Anthony Joshua that he needs to bend his legs?" Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I basically delete that comment because it's a prerequisite. You have to be a fellow world champion to be critical of a world champion or give uh, constructive criticism. Then we wouldn't have any boxing trainers. Plus the fact, I mean, you, you had like, uh, you know, like a hundred amateur fights or, or whatever it was, George, you know, whereas Ray Arcel and um, Angelo Dundee, customizer, never took a punch in their life. And but, nobody but, would but have. I live in the gym. I've been around Charles Ramey. He's one of the greatest trainers, the old man. Yeah. And I don't know if you know the name Jimmy Arthur. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, of course. As a kid, we spent 
every weekend because my my trainer, his trainer was Jimmy Arthur. He would take yeah. us there every weekend so we could work with Art and his fighters. And Jimmy Arthur is just like a boxing savant. He, he passed away in 2011, but yeah. um, he was trained by Jack Blackburn. Okay, well, there's some lineage there. I'm and, taking and Blackburn wasn't just a great trainer. He, he was, was a great, great fighter. fighter. Yeah, he, people you know, realize he, he um, I think he fought Sam Langford seven times. Yeah, yeah, and, and drew with him a bunch of times. Right, and, and he only lost once, a couple were no decision. Then yeah. he beat the first, uh, what's the first African-American lightweight champ? Tevin Farmer's uh, great- Joe great Walker, uncle. Joe Walker. No, uh-uh, his great uncle. Oh, Joe Gens, Joe Gens, Gens. Joe Gens. Yes. Jack Blackburn actually beat Joe Gans. Yeah. And, and when you look at Blackburn's record, I sit up there and go, why people aren't talking about him? As a fighter, they talk about him yeah. as Joe Lewis's trainer. Yeah. But he was a great fighter. He was. And the thing is, and this is the thing, somewhat with, with, without singling out Montel Griffin, with his value base, it's like, no. In fact, uh, he didn't win a world title. That is why you've got to look at who did you fight, who did you beat, and when did you beat them, and who beat you. In a, that's when you've got to analyse a record, and you realise, what, you're going to tell me that Ricky Burns was a better fighter than, Sam, than, than Jack Blackburn because he won three world titles? <laughs> Those are the facts. I just talk straight facts. Nah, that is why, that's why he's wrong. Or Sam that. Langford. Yeah, exactly, because some people will tell you that Langford was the greatest fighter who ever lived. But not Ray Robinson, not Harry Greb. Those are the when you get guys who really know their stuff and, and have a card in the historian guild, you will normally hear them say they'll either go with Robinson, which is kind of the status quo opinion, and I, I understand that and it, it may well be right, or they go with Greb, who, who on paper mm -hmm. seems to have unassailable resume for what and the way in which he achieved it. And, and there's another thing, George, he wasn't a world champion for a very long time, so right. it's obviously more about who you fought and beat, right? Yeah. Because because Greb, some people say Greb, his resume is untouchable, but it's not about the reign of the world title, which is kind of a human construct, right? It's kind mm -hmm. of a man-made thing, you know. So uh, Greb is the other one, and the other one is Langford. And some people, I mean, there's a guy called Spring Salido who's pretty good, who's written books about uh, Greb and other fighters. And he says, I was that guy once saying it was Robinson was the greatest. He said, he's really not. If you really do your homework, None of them compared to Langford. That's his opinion, not mine. No, but, I've heard that. And um, but but there was a guy who didn't ever even won a world title. So you know, you you have to analyze more than than what appear to be the facts and the stats. And that's what yeah. I'm, that's what I keep trying to explain to Montel. But we're not there yet. We're just not there yet. You, you probably won't ever get there. Another one <laughs> that many people talk about: the great Henry Armstrong. Yeah, and it, it's just utterly amazing that someone, and he did win the middleweight title, but they called it a draw yep. from Barcia. Yeah. So he would have held 50% of, of the world all titles world available. titles. 50%. Yeah, yeah. The strange thing about the Garcia fight was that it was only a 10-rounder, right? Mm -hmm. um, it was. Which was odd. Um, and you know what? There was actually a disputed claim going on about the middleweight crown at that time. Mm -hmm. There was a little asterisk over it. But, but regardless, you know, um, everybody says, everybody in the press thought Armstrong won, you know. Um, and for Armstrong, you've got to say, he defended his title five times in a month once. Uh, in 30 days, I think it's six, Ben, the welterweight title. Yeah. He defended it six times in 30 days. Yeah. Successfully. In 1939. Yes. Which, which yeah. is unbelievable. Yeah, and it, it does make you wonder how the, these guys got through it, really, because when people say, you know, Callum Smith was never going to win because he only had four weeks' notice. and But by today's logic, that makes a lot of sense, <laughs> and I understand that. But you look at what Greb, guys like Greb and Armstrong did, and you think, well, they must have been superhuman because how on earth does that even happen? Perhaps it's just... so Maybe it's mind over matter. If you expect... If that is relatively... if It, it might not have been normal, but it was more normal than it is today. So... If your expectations were wrapped up with that kind of culture, maybe you were okay. If as long as you, as long as you told yourself it was going to be okay, you know what I mean. We have guys. Um, I remember Tevin Farmer fought 
three times, defended his title, I believe, three or four times the first year in a 12-month period. I believe yeah. four times in a 12-month period. And uh, there was a reporter from Philadelphia said, oh, my God, that is unbelievable. It's so great. And I said, if Farmer defended his four times in a year, then Henry Armstrong had to be Superman because yeah. he defended his title six times in 30 days. Yeah, I mean, it's these days what passes for active, obviously, is it, it wasn't active back in the day. But, you know, you can't, in a way, it's good that fighters don't have to fight so often as they mm -hmm. used to because, you know, it's, it's, it's not a joke out there. So that the fact that they, they can fight less frequently, it might not be great from the fans' perspective, but it, is, it makes more sense for them, for their long-term health and financially. If you can make big money fighting a couple of times a year, I, you know, I guess that's what you're going to do. No, the only I'm, thing I would I'm say is... For that. Ben, the, yeah. the problem I have with with boxing, not problem, but the thing I noticed, I'm happy that the money's there, and we it's really not distributed because what it, I think the top one percent of boxers in the world make ninety or ninety five percent of all purses, the top one percent. So it's not yeah. like there's equity across the board. So no. we have guys who are fighting four rounders making eight hundred, six hundred or 1200 so but i'm happy that we all can fight this fight to get to that upper echelon so they can make the money but but what concerns me about a a lot of fighters a fighter fights today two months down the road he's out in the gym he's 20 30 pounds over his fighting yeah, yeah i just don't get it it doesn't make sense, and it's not built for longevity. A guy like Ricky Hatton did that all the time. As soon as Ricky Hatton had fought, he was he was absolutely like a Spartan in camp, and he was absolutely tunnel visioned. But as soon as he fought, he was he was letting loose comfort food, party, and obviously alcohol, you know, maybe drugs too. Um, and he got he'd go to Tenerife or somewhere like that, you know, just on holiday with with the boys, with the lads and his gang. And then he would he would put on thirty or forty pounds, and then. Then he, he would start the whole process again. He'd get into camp, he'd get a date. He would diet and train the way he did. You know, he had a nutritionist who was very good. Um, and uh, and that's the way Hank would do it. But if but if you keep yo-yo in up and down like that in weight, it, it doesn't make you last as long as Bernard Hopkins. You know what I mean? It, it just doesn't work. Or, or Floyd Mayweather. Those or are Floyd Mayweather. Guys. Exactly. They, I mean, I, I hear Hopkins was on his diet all year round. Uh, he would I go to bed that. like and at I've 9 o'clock. I've seen him outside of training camp. And yeah. they said he lived like a monk. He ate yeah. right. Uh, it had been 15 years or 20 years he hadn't eaten a piece of cake. I mean, yeah. got to take our hats off to Bernard Hopkins. He was very disciplined. Yeah. 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 And, and uh, another thing Hopkins said I found was interesting. When they asked him the secret to his longevity, he said, one thing, except for my training, um, he said, I, I don't hardly ever do anything. He said, I'm literally lying down the rest of the time. He said, I try not to do anything if I can help it, except in the gym and obviously in the ring. He said, so the rest of the day, if I'm not training, I'm pretty much lying down horizontal if I can get away with it, which that was interesting. And, and it shows now that he's retired, he looks good. Yeah, he does, yeah. Most fighters you see, once they retire, mm, they're 40 pounds, 50 pounds. Overweight, but Hopkins actually looks great. Yeah, he does. Yeah, and um, and you know, you know who else is kind of like that? Who's, um, there's a few fighters like that, but Jim McDonald. Remember who fought Azuma Nelson and um, yeah, Brian Mitchell. Jim, mm -hmm. They trained James DeGay, all right, and, and Danny Williams and stuff. Mm -hmm. He's still in, in in great nick. You know, he's got to be, he's got to be sixty uh, at this point. Um, and he's still fitter than most of the fighters he trains. He still goes <laughs> running in the forest. He, he used to outlift them, outperform them, all the rest of it. And he's he's still in great nick and has hardly put a pound, hardly a pound over featherweight, which is great to see. And, and the man we have to give credit to, the great Sugar Ray Leonard. Yeah, he looks brilliant. Ray, what's Ray now? A junior middleweight? <laughs> Look he, at him. He, he looks about one five four, and he, you know, he doesn't. Um, I mean, what, he's 60, he's got to be 60. Uh, he was born four. 56. He was born 1956. Yeah, so, so he's got to be 64, right? Or he, yes. He's coming yes. up 65 next May, right? Yes. 
and um, and it, he looks. If somebody told you he was like thirty eight, you might, you know, forty. You he's in great shape. Was. Yeah, he's in great. He actually took good care of himself, and you know, I follow him on Instagram. He's yeah. always working out. He's hitting the bag. He's jumping rope. But Leonard, uh, from all I've heard, took great care of his money. He invested wisely. He did, and I think Mike Trainer helped with that a lot, you know, because Mike yeah. Trainer was obviously a, a, a very smart guy business wise. And uh, what Ray managed to have with, with having him on board was not like a fight manager, you know, someone who's part of this business and the shark infested mm -hmm. nature that it, that, it, that it has. He didn't have a boxing manager who who had a license with a commission. He had a he had a, a financial expert from the outside yeah. world, the bigger corporate world, who actually did look after him. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. when when I interviewed Ray the first time, I, I said you didn't have a manager, you had an attorney, and he liked that. He said, yeah, "You're right. I, I didn't have a manager, I had an attorney." You know, so he, that was significant. You know, the difference. And he said, in something like boxing and life generally. You have to find one person to trust, and that person for me was Mike Trainer. You know, mm -hmm. and he does say, you know, Angelo and Dundee, um, they ne him and Angelo and Mike Trainer never got along. There was a lot of tension there mm -hmm. because Trainer didn't think that Angie was doing enough for him. Because mm -hmm. the thing with the thing with Angelo and Dundee, and, and people, that's what Ray said to me. So people don't know this, but Angie never didn't train me per se. He would come in two weeks before a fight. I know. That's and why I tell people. You know about this. So well, exactly. Pepe, so Pepe trained him. Yeah, and, and, and Dave and Jacobs, Jacobs and Jack the, other, the other gentleman, Jacobs. Jack Morton, Janks Morton as well. They, they were his right, Janks team. Morton, right. Yeah, they were his three people who were always there since the amateurs. They were in Palmer Park. They were always there. Mm -hmm. Then obviously Dundee is this really massively respected kind of guru who who would come in and tweak things. And his defense, Angelo's defense to the suggestion he wasn't doing enough was, listen, I ain't no sweat wiper. You don't get me all the time to hold your hand. Only my wife gets that. But to be honest, a, a trainer is, it's normally more of an intimate, constant relationship than that, isn't it, for most fighters mm -hmm. and coaches. So um, in the end, trainer, or not in the end, quite soon, trainer renegotiated uh, Angel Angelo's feet. He was no longer getting 15%. It was cut to something like 10 because Initially, he was getting 15 when the, when the contract started, I believe. And he, and he cut it down because he said, you're just not doing enough for him. And then when Ray got nearly got bashed up by Marcus Geraldo and, and he got mm -hmm. the, the eye damage, which I think might have later caused a detached retina, he, he was really not happy about that. And he said, how dare you not do your due diligence? He said to, to Dundee, what, you put him in with a big rangy middleweight like that? So, oh, he was then, big, Marcus Geraldo. Yeah. Didn't he go 10, he went 10 rounds with Marvin Hagler. He did. And then he got blown away by Tommy Hearns in a fight that looked rather suspicious, actually. If yes. you look at the, it, it, it looked like if he was looking for a spot to lie, you know what I mean, in, in the Hearns fight, because I'm not sure what the story was there. But, but yeah, so Dundee didn't, didn't constantly work with Ray in camp. And, uh, and Mike Trainer didn't like that and said, listen, you, and you know what Ray said anyway, because Ray ultimately, as much as he loved Angie, his loyalty and affinity was with Trainer. Mm -hmm. And he said, if Angie wasn't happy about his fee being cut, He's got to realize he didn't do what he was hired to do. That's what Ray actually said, you know. So, and that's fair. It, the trainers are there every day. Most old school trainers taking the fighter running, they're spending yeah. hours in the gym, setting up sparring, doing everything. Old school trainers holding the pads, doing every single thing, even holding your feet while you do your, the sit ups. Yeah. You yeah. know, and one thing I want to talk to you about, Ben, and this always bothers me because nowadays I hear, I call a lot of people charlatans. We hear people talk about, well, um, you need this trainer. This trainer can't take you to the next level. The thing yeah. I, I say about boxing, I'll say this. Um, me personally, I like to see trainers like Floyd, and if Floyd Senior and a bunch of other trainers, they take a kid from here and take them all the way to a world title. Pretty much like Virgil uh, Hunter with Andre yeah. Ward. Now you have these trainers and you have these shysters, these managers come in. They sign these kids, 
and take them to their in-house trainers. And people say, well, this train is great. I don't, and, and, and the person we use as the, uh, the example, and I'm not one to disparage anyone or say, but this is the fact. I hear people say, well, Freddie Roach is a great trainer. And yeah. I said, I don't know whether he is or he's not. Can't comment on it. What I do know, I've never seen a fighter that Freddie has trained from the amateurs all the way to the professional. I yeah. can say that for Floyd Mayweather Sr. I can say that for Virgil Hunter. I can say that for a number of other You can trainers. say it for Enzo Calzaghi even. And train the son. We can yeah. say for Lomachenko's father. Yeah. But if you are in the habit of getting fighters when they're contenders or world champion, how good are you? Well, this is it. And they call them cherry pickers sometimes, you know. Um, Freddie, to be fair, did say once, when his, when his stats were at this level in a Boxer News interview, he said, I didn't make 22 world champions. 22 world champions made me. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot of truth in that. And Freddie understood it, you know. But I suspect he is a very good coach who's a very good strategist, a good corner man, all the rest of it. Um, but but think about team. this. Freddie Roach has won Trainer of the Year seven times. Yeah. Floyd, C Floyd Mayweather Jr. was fighter of the decade, the 2010 to 2020, that decade. He's yeah. won fight of the year, I think, three times, won numerous awards from ESPN. But yet his father and uncle have never won train of the year. Why is that? It doesn't make sense. And I guess because they're not fancy, they're not part of that in crowd, you know, um, ben, is what it comes down to. It's because, and people don't want to say it, the Boxing Writers Association of America made up of people who've never boxed, the group yeah. of 99% of them who look just like you. If that group consisted of all Jamaicans, right, I would be right of the year every year. Yeah. Or at least five years out of 10. I think it's so misunderstood, the mystique around the trainer. I think people talk such a lot of rubbish about it because like you said, when, when, when you spoke about Freddie Roach, you said, I don't know if he is or is not a good coach. I don't. I've never been in the I simply know he's had fantastic talent to work with yes. when it was already half made or more than half made. And that's so true because people who, who never go to the gym, maybe they've never boxed in their life either, they say to me, oh, I think he needs to go with Virgil Hunter or he should be with Joe Gallagher. And I, I'm not so with the greatest respect. How, how would you know? I mean, because I don't know. So you must be smarter than me if you know that. You know what I mean? Because it's not, I, I don't judge a coach unless I've seen him in the gym. And the thing is... I'm the same way, Ben. You know. And the I, thing is, I get to see trainers in the gym, so I can say that. Otherwise, if you never were in the gym, you could, you'd could ne you never have an opinion at all, would you? Because you wouldn't get to see him. So I've seen Jimmy Tibbs working with Billy Joe Saunders and other, lots of other fighters. I've seen um, other guys... Um, who have reputations in England, you know, like a, a guy like Brian Lawrence, who's reasonably well thought of. Uh, I've seen some of the amateur legends like Tony Burch and the famous Repton Boxing Club. I worked with him when I was a coach of that club. So I've seen a few top coaches do their thing in the gym and I've been around them for a few years. I've seen Robert McCracken, who obviously works with um, Andy Joshua and, I, mm. and I've spoken to him about, you know, I've seen him in the gym with Carl Fotch and, and, and such. So, I think that's when you get a feel for it. And sometimes you must know, you, you, you would have had this experience where there's an unknown coach you could name to me who happens to be really good and he's a bit of a guru and a bit of an encyclopedia who's got some fascinating methods and, and some great knowledge and he's never gotten a break. You must know guys You're right. like that. You're right. Especially in the old city that you live in. Yeah. So, and the world will never hear of these guys probably. I mean, please God, maybe they do get a break. But the chances are half the time they will never get the break. But you may well think with justification that they are better than this sacred cow who was on a platform, right? I've, I've been around the old man my life, my trainer. And the reason why I was a kid and I, he started training when I was 15. I had been boxing since I was 12. It, it's just, it was just something about him. You get my point, my trainer, Charles Ramey. Um, yeah. Then I later discovered that everyone knew Jimmy Arthur, that he yeah. was Jimmy Arthur's fighter. But the, the thing about my trainer, the old man and Jimmy Arthur, these guys could 
take anybody, really. And how can I put it? They wouldn't change you. They would take your assets and make you a really good fighter. Yeah. Doing what you're really good at. You, you get my point? All the fighters these guys train look different. And I think that is important because if a, a guy like Customato obviously did well with his blueprints and he, he turned that three, you know, very Floyd, good. Uh, um, but, Floyd Patterson. Jose, Jose Torres and, and Mike. But the thing is, it does appear to me that DeMarto only had one one blueprint and one way of teaching a fighter. He if didn't you look seem at Floyd, to... If you look at Floyd Patterson and look at Mike Tyson, the major difference is Mike Tyson was a bigger faster version of Floyd Patterson, even though Floyd was smaller. Who took Mike a better was, shot. Mm -hmm. Took a better shot too, right? Yes. Yeah. Mike was so, a bigger, those, faster those, version of Floyd Patterson. So those, so those are th three pretty important things. More durable, bigger, faster. That means yeah. you're really good to go. That means you were devastated with that same blueprint, that same yes. style. You yes. Know? Um, you know, so... But but if, if DeMarto got a fighter, like Wilfred Benitez maybe, or like Nicolino Losh or something like that, I guess he couldn't have trained them. I guess he couldn't no. have worked with them. They would have had to have gone somewhere else. I'm guessing. Yes, yes. And, and, and that's what I say is a great trainer because I've seen some trainers and they take a fighter and regardless if the guy is 6'4 or 6'5 or 5'2, they all fight the same. Yeah. 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 But um, with, with Philly here, Jimmy Arthur has to be one of the greatest trainers. Um. This guy was so patient. He used to train horses. Um, it's <laughs> he used to train animals. I, I sat yeah. in the gym with him, and he's so patient. He really developed fighters, Jimmy Arthur. But he never got the notoriety or the fame. He's the one that trained Tyrone Everett, that lost to Alfredo yeah. Escalera, one of the biggest robbery yeah. in history. People <clears throat> say, yeah, Mike's but, uh, brother. But he's trained other fighters like Gerald the Jedi Noble. Uh, heavyweight from Philadelphia, um, yeah. Frankie Mitchell, who fought Chavez, and a bunch of other Philly fighters. Yeah. Great, great trainer, but never got the accolades. Nah, and that's the way it goes. It's, it's, it's part, there's a lot of luck attached to it. You know, and, um, and that's what builds a reputation. It build, you know, obviously, once, once you've had a, a very, very good fighter who's got a lot of attention on him, Fighters will start flocking to you sometimes, and then you yeah. know it's difficult. It's difficult to make a mess of that, really. You know, half the time. But it's funny because De La Hoya worked with different guys, quite a few different trainers. He, he was quite a coach hopping fighter, and it was interesting. Oh, in his man, I'm glad way. you're. I'm, I'm glad you're mentioning that, Ben. That's something I yeah. want to talk to someone about. Um, yeah. I love Oscar De La Hoya. I, I watch him coming out of the Olympics, and ah, uh, what's this? Oh. Yeah, we can. Yeah, Chris just put it in Um, I look at Oscar. Had it all. Had a chin, fast hands combination. You know what I believe? I honestly believe, and this is the difference between Floyd, Oscar, Andre Ward. I believe had Oscar stayed with one trainer, one great trainer, he probably would have been close to unbeatable. But, See, yeah, because this is the, sometimes the grass isn't greener. I mean, he he was with like, Robert Garcia. Yeah, was it Robert Garcia. Uh, he, he was with uh, Manny Stewart, obviously. He worked he with Freddie Roach. He, yes. he worked with Freddie Roach as well. You know, I, I, I thought Robbie, he even dug up Jack Blackburn at one point. He, he with who? I think he dug up Jack Blackburn yeah, from the yeah, grass. Yeah, yeah, get it. Yeah, 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 no <laughs> doubt. yeah, just. That, that, that wouldn't surprise me, yeah. Um, but And he was saying he didn't really rate Manny as highly as you might do. What did he say? He said he was good strategist. He said he was good. He said Manny's thing was aggression, and he told him to be more aggressive and, 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 and to, to take guys out more and, and to get on them more. But but he said he didn't like the pad work. He said he would flap the pads at you in, in the mix in a strange way. So it's funny listening to what some people say about different coaches. And then obviously... I think he kind of denounced Freddie Roach after he'd been with him, after he'd lost to um, Floyd Mayweather, I guess. He was with Freddie Roach then, I believe. You know, and, so. and for Oscar, well, we've got the impression that Oscar, because and he Floyd was Mayweather with, he was with. He was with Floyd Mayweather Sr., right? Yes, he was. Yeah. And I, I believe with Oscar, nice guy. He did well. 
I think, Oscar, there's a time where you have fighters who believe they know everything and they know more than the trainers. And the trainer just basically there to uh, yeah. accommodate them. That's kind of what Ronnie Davies did a little bit with Chris Eubank. Chris Eubank said, kind of called the shots there. when he um, From the very first time they made an alliance, um, I think Davies said to him, you don't need to train more than five days a week. And Newbank said, you can do what you like, but I shall be here seven days a week, you know, which you've already got that kind of mm -hmm. uh, pecking order on the wrong side, really, you know. And um, uh, even Eubank Jr. once said that Ronnie Davies is just there to put Vaseline on my face. That's it, which which is quite a disrespect to a trainer, but I guess he was getting he was getting decent money and he swallowed it, you know. But 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 uh, Eubank was one of those guys who wanted to tell the trainer what to do. And, and, and a lot of these trainers in... I've seen it happen so much. A kid comes up, right? And the trainer is there through the amateurs. The kid turned pro, starts making some money. And so many of the trainers become a yes man. And, and yeah. I can say this, Ben, my, my trainer, Charles Ramey, if my phone rang now and he told me to come by his house to pick up something, I'm ending this conversation. I'm hopping in the car. I'm going over to his house. You see my yeah. point? Um, yeah. that respect is there. It, if I'm making any major decision outside of boxing, you know who I'm running, I will run it by him. You, you get my point? Yeah. So it's always yeah. that. And it, it, and it's not that I don't have an opinion or whatever, but you got to trust somebody. You exactly. got to have that respect. And he's not a yes man. I've seen so many trainers. I, I, the old man said this to me. He said, uh, Drew, because I, I have some fighters that I train. And he said, well, what happened when they get really good? I said, the reality is I treat everybody, everyone with respect. I don't yell at fighters. I don't belittle anybody. I talk to them just like the old man spoke to me. Even though I was a kid, he spoke to me as an adult and he just had respect. You get my point? Yeah, yeah. And I, I say, if I have a fighter, one of my fighters, get to the point where they're really doing well about to win the world title, I can't become a yes man no. or a yes person. And he said, would you be willing to let them go to somebody else? Let the door hit you where the good Lord split you. Um, on my scale of one to a hundred, money doesn't hit my first 100 as far as motivation. No. So if somebody, yeah. I can't be a yes man. And I've seen so many trainers get into a fight and there are yet, they become a yes man because they don't want to lose the fighter. Yeah. Yeah, I can't sure. change. Now it's got to be about principles. I mean, it's it's got to be well, what what do you want me for? Because if you don't if you don't want me to to do my job, then maybe you need to get someone else who's happy just to be a, you know, a puppet. Yep, and and a lot of these and what happens? You see a lot of these fighters. They're not with the trainers who got them there. They're with some other yeah. trainer. And a lot of trainers, I, I tell them, go buy a bunch of pom-poms. You're cheerleaders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't be critical. Yes, champ, you're doing well. Yes, champ, you look good. Man, please. You know, yeah, if I, I can't tell you the they, truth, then you go find someone else. Sometimes they don't know what to tell them in the first place. I've seen guys even, they're okay when everything's going well, but when there's a crisis, they don't know how to deal with it. And, and that can happen at quite a high level. I remember thinking when Nonito Donaire lost to Rigondeau. Yes. I, 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 do, I can't remember uh, sharply anymore what was being said, but I do remember having the impression his corner didn't have a clue. You know, in terms of just thinking, well, how do we combat this, this ultra matrix like slick Southpaw? They didn't really have any ideas to give him. You know what I mean? It was just like, well, you've been knocking guys out up to now. And we've, been, we've been doing the water and the end swell and we figured that'd be okay. You know, so that's what I, I remember, remember that fight quite well. And you are absolutely right. And I'm saying, did you guys not have enough film on Rigondeaux? It's not like yeah. we didn't know who he was. Yeah, I think you've got to have a game plan. Well, you've got to have more than one game plan. You've got to have like three or four game plans, depending yes. on what happens. And you've got to try and assimilate as best you can what you're going to be facing. And especially, you, you, know, it doesn't, you shouldn't underestimate anybody. But like you say, you know Rigondeaux is going to be a hard fight. And, and he's yeah. going to be capable of of ruining everything or, or interrupting that kind of 
rise. So yeah, I mean, but yeah, the, and I think so. Okay, even at the highest level, that can happen. You get guys, they're okay when the fighters winning and taking care of business, but when he needs them, and this is where they come to earn their money, that they, they they haven't always got a lot to offer, and it doesn't matter how high they've managed to climb. Sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So sometimes I wonder how much film work or how much study do a lot of these trainers do? Because you and I know fighters have habits. It's repetition. How do you train for a guy to counter certain yeah. uh, tendencies? So sometimes I wonder how many of these trainers sit down and really break it down and watch film with the fighter and look and at they, other things. They, and they really should because, you know, you will know this as well because you've been a, a, around the game. Some fighters don't like to watch their opponents. So yeah. they, do, they don't want to do it. They, they have, might have different reasons, but some of them are like, no, I ain't worried about what he's going to do. You've got to worry about what I'm going to do. They don't want to watch it. They don't want to take <laughs> the information in in case they get too impressed, maybe, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when they've got a good coach who they really rely on, they'll say, my trainer watches the guy. I don't watch him. He watches him and he tells me what I've got to do to beat him. I think that's fine. I think that can work absolutely fine. If the fighters, don't get me wrong, some fighters love to watch their opponents. They wouldn't dream of going, they wouldn't dream of going in the ring with somebody if there was footage available without watching it. It depends. Personally, I don't know about you, but I was a guy who liked to watch who I was fighting. If I, if I, if I could see some, some tapes of him, I would, that was great. And, it, and if you couldn't, it was too bad. But some fighters don't want to watch the guy. Uh, and it's, I think it is quite common. And obviously, in that case, they really need a coach to study that guy. If they're not even going to watch him. Ben, I, I love in tournaments or guys I knew that I had to fight in my division as an amateur. Yeah. I'm sitting at ringside watching them when they're fighting. Yeah, because you, I want to see them. Yeah, because to me, it doesn't make sense. To be honest with you, I'm one of the guys who wants to watch. I remember yeah. Muhammad Ali in his autobiography, which was heavily ghosted, but. I, Technically, the voice of Ali was saying, I like to watch as much as I can of an opponent in camp. You know, he mm -hmm. said, but I, he said, I did hear some fighters like Rocky Marciano was one of them who, who, who didn't watch a damn, a damn lick of a second of footage of, of, the, of their opponents. That was their mindset. I do understand it, but I don't, I don't empathize with it. Mm -hmm. Another topic, I've, and, and I'm glad the Charlo brothers, Jamal and Jamel, a couple of years ago, a year or two ago, they posted a video and I'll be posted on Facebook this week talking about the patch. Yeah. Um, yeah. Ben, I, I don't know about you, but me, we have in boxing a uh, lot of people who've never as much as bust the grape yeah. at a fruit fight, couldn't teach a dog how to bark or a flea how to hop up on a dog yeah. or a tick how to hop on a cow. But they have mastered the art of pad work. And yeah. all these fighters walk into the gym, or these current fighters, and everyone want to do the Floyd Mayweather, what we call yeah. the patty cakes. Yeah. And, and to me, I've seen it develop so many bad habits because the average fighter now is landing at about 21, 22%. Floyd is the highest he lands, 51 or 52%. But every time you bring the pad, to the punch, you never get full extension. And I see everybody yeah. doing this fancy pad work and it's so wonderful and all this stuff. But then when the bell rings, you can't get them to throw a three punch combination. Yeah, it's, it's true. I it's, hate pad work. I, I know it's a big, I know it's a big um, kind of um, hate of yours. I'll be honest with you. I went through a phase of it. I mean, I'm talking uh, maybe 10 years ago now. I thought, you know what? I first saw Tunde Ajayi doing it, you know, um, with the guy who trains Anthony Yard, okay? Mm -hmm. Who um, the guy that told more. him not to, the guy that told him he didn't have to spar. Yeah, yeah, he's been getting a lot of stick lately, Tunde. But Tunde is kind of one of Spencer's other sidekick. If I'm Spencer's kind of um, white sidekick, Tunde Tunde is his brother's sidekick. Yeah, he's got two two double X. He's part of you know, it's fun the tree, and. Um, so those two guys are close, but 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 Tundi is getting a lot of stick right now, a lot of criticism because Yard yeah, just got beat by a guy called Lyndon Arthur, right? You know, for yeah. a Commonwealth title, and it was a fight I certainly think was a winnable fight, and I do think that perhaps perhaps his, maybe his corner advice that he was received could have been better, but I won't get into that. But 
But in any case, I first saw Tutti Ajayi in like what must have been 2008, doing it with this wonder kid he had who was about 12 years old who was doing all that stuff. And you'd like to say, like a thousand punch combination, literally a th thousand punch combination he could throw. And at the time, I was younger in the program. I'd, 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 I'd boxed obviously for years mm -hmm. and I'd been coaching amateurs for a few years. And I was just, I was about to get my professional license for the border control, which at the time was a big deal to me back then. And I, I was impressed for, with, with the, with the visual aspect of it. And I thought, yeah, that looks really good. I can't relate to what I was thinking when I think about that today, but at the time it seemed important. I thought, you know what, this is, and then I saw Floyd was doing that kind of thing. And I saw Yuri Gamboa doing something similar to that as well, that looked actually more impressive than the Floyd Mayweather pad work. And I thought, yeah, this must, this is the revolutionary new kind of approach and I need to learn it. And I spent a few couple of years becoming very adept at that kind of flashy, eye candy pad work that people go well you know and all those videos and my view on it today i'm no longer interested in using it i, I use it occasionally for a party piece just for fun or, or if a client likes it just a fitness boxing client or if you're just trying to use some kind of muscular endurance thing where you're just getting them to throw lots and lots of punches and make it more interesting than just go one two one two one two for instance that's the only time i use it um the these days i just set up real situations on the pads, you know, but come back in one shot or two shots or mm -hmm. whatever, you know. Um, but back then, yeah, I, I went through a phase of doing that. What I found was you become too obsessed with the routines and you forgot a little bit about the boxing. You end up becoming too obsessed with watching the videos back and fighter and trainer be like, oh, I really like that set there. But you know what? We need to do that again, but with the pull and then the catch body. And then you, at some point I thought, hang on a second, what, what, what has happened here? I was getting impressed. I tell the people, the, the, the people who do it, and um, I will tell them before, take out a video and show a kid a video of one of your fights. Yeah. They have no documentation. Um, I, I'm going to say this, and people might say, I, I'm, I'm very extreme. It's a bunch of bullshit, period. Yeah. You get my point? Um, Jimmy Arthur, the greatest trainer in Philadelphia, and I doubt if anyone in Philadelphia would argue against it, um, greatest trainer, never owned a pair of pads, never used See, them. There you go, George. That's the thing. Not only is the, what you described, the modern kind of mitt work, Mayweather style mitt work, not only is that... Uh, um, one second. Uh, let me decline this call here. No problem. No problem. Not only is that overrated, but perhaps pad work of any kind of description is overrated because yeah. some fighters didn't do it. Like, you never saw Muhammad Ali hit pads. I've never seen that video that, or, or photograph, never. So he didn't do it. So what did he do? He did road work, sparring, yeah. ground work, bag work, skipping, and calisthenics, right? You know, that's ground work. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying we can't improve on that system. You know what? I don't mind some slightly more side scientific approach with Evander Holyfield doing the conditioning he was doing when he was with that Tim Hallmark guy. Some of it looked good, you know, circuits. I think we can learn stuff of MMA fighters to a degree. You see some of their conditioning look good. I might I might see the odd thing, which I think is boxing specific. And I think that's cool. So I'm not saying we have to train just like Lewis and Blackburn did or Marciano and, and Goldman. I'm not saying we can't evolve a little bit, but the pads probably are overrated because what I find, right, having coached, various levels myself over the years you get bored with pads you get stale with pads and you and it ends up becoming more about the pad work and trying to vary it around and keep yourself interested than it becomes about the boxing and sometimes suppose you forget your pads or, or, you, or you think i'm leaving the pads at home today you ha you have a session with a fighter or a client and you think that was much more interesting we did different stuff today i watched him shadow box i watched him on the bag we did a footwork drill and you think you know what too much significance has been attached to these damn things these days. And, because... and, and Ben, you have guys holding the pads. The, the thing I say, the people who are using the pads, the overwhelming majority of people I see doing that type of pad work, they've never boxed a day in their life. Period. No. So how are you going to teach somebody? I'm not saying most people who are teaching boxing, I, I believe you, I don't coach basketball, even though I've watched it my entire life. I don't know the intricacies. But you have yeah. people who make it up. I've seen so many guys in the gym, they make it up because kids don't know any different and they make it up. And you have, you can luck up 
not knowing anything about boxing and train a great fighter because kids will follow and you'll pick things up as you go along. But as yeah. far as the pad work, the, the, all the people I see doing the pad work, most of them have never boxed. They, what they know about boxing can fit comfortable on the back of a po postage stamp. And then they but, see Floyd do all that fancy stuff. Yeah. But Floyd lands 52% of his punches. Why do you think Floyd did it, and Roger and Floyd? Why do you think they did that with him? And why do you think he did it so much? Um, because we're still talking about it 20 years later. And uh, <laughs> and it looks great. Especially do you think it was a, just a party piece and not like a decoy? It, it looks great it on just... media day. But, but then Floyd is a boxer but, savant. He, he's been boxing since he came out the womb. He's been around his father. So if Floyd is just tapping the pad, he knows what he has to do when he's in there. And the thing with Floyd, like you said, about, you know, they throw all his combination on the pads. But Floyd, in his latter days, he, he scarcely put three shots together, did he? It was a single shot picker. Floyd would throw a jab to the body, uh, counter right hand. Yes. Or sometimes a one-two, not, not very often. And, and that, that counter left hook, or the, what he called a check left hook, yeah. or, or, the, or the jump in lead left hook. But that was Floyd, right? He'd, he'd throw one, two, and very occasionally he might put three together. That was it. But, but we have all these people, uh, they're pad masters and padologists. Boxing is about teaching technique. And I've, I've never seen, when they start putting pad masters in the Hall of Fame, then maybe I'll consider it. Yeah. <laughs> No, the short answer to your question, anyway, is I am well over it these days. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say I didn't go through a phase of thinking that was what it was. That that was important. And for a while, I became a little bit too obsessed with that kind of thing. Um, I'll put it down to relative youth, although I wasn't. I was hardly a teenager at the time, you know. But um, no, I mean, I, I I'm over it. I, I'm well over it. I, it doesn't. I, these days, I couldn't give. I couldn't give a damn what the pad work looks like. I, it's either got a purpose or it hasn't. I do not care what mm. it looks like. Do you know what? If somebody wants me to show off for a movie or something, I can still yes. do it. Don't forget I don't blame it. You. And you know what? I'm glad I can still do it because I can say I can say it's it's spurious. And, mm -hmm. so, and people say, "What? Well, what? Well, can you do it?" And I can say, "Yeah, I can." Well, 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 I can have a conversation with them while I'm doing it, and I can say, "I just don't really rate it anymore." Okay, you know. You have guys tapping people on the elbow and doing all this stuff and yeah, back here and and yeah. come on, really? Are you really going? Gonna... The triggers is interesting because the idea that if I say I catch a punch here, that so me being orthodox, if I'm boxing another orthodox, that's a right mm -hmm. hook to the body, right? So mm -hmm. if the pad is if the pad work is teaching me to catch and then throw the uppercut, the hook, and the mm -hmm. straight, so every time it goes like bang, I go, that might work just on its own. It will. Just, um, we'll call it a trigger, like bang, 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 mm -hmm. bang. That's fair enough. But I guess I don't have to um, go from there roll out, throw that, two hooks, one uppercut, pull back, there. you know what I mean? That, that's probably not going to happen. But Mate, the, so the, young, the young people entered the gym. Um, I had someone once came in the gym and said, when are we going to do the pad work? I said, let me tell you something. I'm not a pad master. I'm not a pedologist or whatever you call it. I use the pads to teach you how to punch correctly, but I'm not going to be in here doing that fancy stuff. So I'm not the right trainer for you. Yeah. And the kid went to someone else. So I didn't feel bad. Um, you're not going to tell me, oh, when are we going to do the pad work? When are we going to do the pad? If you need somebody to do pad work and do that fancy stuff, I can teach somebody how to do that pad work like Mayweather. Give me a week. But yeah, does yeah, that mean you can box? Of course. Do you know what pad work I like to do a lot of the time? I think probably the most, probably my favorite thing I do with the pads or what I think is most useful uh, I'll put a, a pad on here, there, right? Mm -hmm. The pad, and I'll put a glove on this hand. Sometimes as well, I'll put the body belt on. Let's, let's mm -hmm. say I do on this occasion. So the body belt as well. Then I'll say, there's your opponent's head, right? Mm -hmm. I want you to hit it with any straight point. I'll say just a jab maybe to start with. Just right. Every time you can hit it with a jab, you hit it with a jab. But here's the catch. He's going to move his head a little bit and he's going to move mm -hmm. his feet a bit. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll be making that move and making it move backwards and, and using my legs. The other catch is going to hit you back with a jab, right? He's, he's going to just tap you back with a jab. So you've got to negotiate that. And and the, the advanced form of it is to say, if you can hit me in the body anywhere, that's up to you. you any, anything is fair game underneath there. So your jabs go there or maybe you're straight right if we want to develop it more. Stay out of the way of my jab. You've got to find the target and you've got downstairs as well. 
And that's why I like to work with fighters because mm -hmm. they're looking for straight punches, they're looking for body shots, and they've got to slip the jab all the time. You know, you know what's amazing to me, Ben, and one of the first moves when I was a kid in the gym, there's a trainer, Dick Turner, former welterweight contender. Yeah. He would teach us first thing, your stance, how to jab, then block a jab. Do you know what I noticed about some professional fighters today I'm watching? They don't know how to block a jab. No. They don't know how to catch a jab. And you should know, I remember Brendan Ingle, who you, you'll be familiar with from Sheffield, who trained Nassim Hammond, Harold Graham, and uh, a lot of other guys. He was saying that somebody said to him one time, a newcomer said to him, how do you defend against a left jab? And he said, I can show you about 10 ways. Um, yes. And obviously there is 10 ways, you know, we could go for them now. Um, you could actually find a couple more than 10, I imagine. Mm -hmm. what? And that's what a trainer should know. <laughs> uh, no, um, a lot of these, this is the only sport that you can throw a towel over your shoulder and you're a trainer. Yeah, yeah. It, that's, that's just the way it is. We get in debates all the time, but- um, Yeah, there's a lot of charlatans because like you say, I think the, the, the mystique of the trainer is, 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 is immense. I and mean, there's a lot of mystery around it and a lot of misconceptions. And as you've said, as we've spoke about in the course of this conversation, there are some people who've even got a resume and, and are at the, where you're still not convinced they're necessarily such a great teacher, but they've managed to get to a certain level. So from the absolute charlatan who really shouldn't be there at all, you've got other people who are simply maybe just a little bit overrated or, you know, become yeah. a little bit I, rested I, I, on their law. If I could go back in time and say I was filthy rich and I could build a boxing camp in Jamaica and anywhere, and I could get all the kids from Jamaica and I could get Jimmy Arthur, take him to Jamaica, right? And build yeah. up a boxing camp. I would bet any amount of money, Jamaica would, would, would have produced many world champions. Yeah. Just having Jimmy Arthur secluded to train all these fighters. He was that yeah. good. He, yeah. he was that great. Um, no one in Philly will, will argue. And if they argue, they don't know anything about boxing. Jimmy Arthur, that most people don't even know, is the greatest trainer in Philadelphia. Yeah. We don't even debate it. No, he was that good. Really to me. He was that good, Jimmy Arthur. And most people don't know about him. Yeah. Well, this has been very good, man. Um, let me ask a question. And I'm going to say, since you're from England, I look at, I was talking about Anthony Joshua's form, right? Yeah. And, and it looks to me, um, he's good, but I, I was looking at his punches. The last fight, he was standing straight up and throwing upper, uppercuts. Yeah. He never bent his legs, yeah. which I'm saying to myself, hmm, um, I mean, that, that's the way you're supposed to do it, is, is to bend your knees, obviously, you know. Um, wasn't bad. Certainly, I mean, I guess you could turn the back foot and maybe say, yeah. you rely on that instead of instead of bending your knees. But I always think the way to do it is, is to bend the knees and just get right. that extra little bit of leverage, either mm -hmm. hand, you know. But um, like I say, Anthony Joshua had not actually been boxing that long, for, you know, as much I, as he's achieved. It's, a, it's amazing. How old was he when he started, 17 or 18? Yeah, he was already like a, you know, the end of his teens kind of thing. You know, he was, he he, he had some ridiculous span from his first novice title to winning a version of the World Heavyweight Championship. There's only like a four year kind of window there. Yeah, yeah. It, but, it's know, amazing though. But John Lewis, you know, to start that late. Joe, Joe Lewis didn't start until, I think Joe Lewis won the Golden Gloves or the National US Ch Championships. So yeah, Utah or something like that in 34. Mm -hmm. And then he was World Heavyweight Champion in 1937, which is yeah, pretty staggering. Yeah. Um, it's, I think Joshua had the shortest time from his professional career, from the time he started to win in the heavyweight title. I think it's two and a half or three years from the time he came out the Olympics to the time he won the heavyweight title. I think it's two and a half years. But Tyson did it in 20 months, right? Yes, yes. I think Joshua is number two. 
yeah, yeah, could be, certainly could be. Which is, it's an incredible run, and um, for him to regain the title, and I'm just praying at this stage that it that the next fight is Tyson Fury versus Anthony yeah. Joshua. We don't need to see anything else. No, we don't, and it sounds like. It sounds like enough people are on the same page about that right now. I mean, I'd, Fury definitely uh, wants it. And I know Frank Warren and Bob Aaron want it. I think Eddie Hearn wants it. I do. And I, and I, and I sounds like Anthony Joshua wants it. So there shouldn't be too much in the way of it, really. There are two fights they have to make. Joshua versus Fury. No-brainer. Yeah. Biggest fight in 2021. The next fight, Errol Spence. Crawford. Terence Crawford. We don't need yeah. to hear about fighting a tune-up or anyone else. Those two fights. Yeah. It's simple as that. And let's, and let's hope, you know, 2020 has been a strange year, but let's hope we see both of those next year regardless. Yes, those are two fights we need to see. Um, Absolutely. Huge fight. Anthony Joshua, where would they hold that fight in England? The O2 Arena? No, nah, that, that would be a Wembley. That would be a Wembley. Wembley. How many Wem it, Wembley hold? 120,000? It can hold 100,000 for sure. You know, It can definitely hold more. People always joke about the 80,000 because Carl Froch was, was legendary for banging on about the fact that he, he, he knocked out George Groves in front of 80,000 people. The fact that he told that to Floyd Mayweather during an interview, it's become a joke. In, it's become an in-joke in British boxing. Everybody talks about 80,000 at Wembley. Um, but, but it actually can hold more than that. So, yeah, it would, it would be Wembley. But, you know, they've already been making noises that they might have it in the United Arab Emirates again, like with the Joshua Ruiz 2 thing. Uh, because I, it sounds like they can get more money out there. And, you know, and it's the way Eddie Hunt says it, it is. People say it'd be a tragedy if it doesn't happen in Britain and it'd be wrong morally. Can I say this, Ben? And we know it's all about the money, but we're talking about history, loyalty, and everything else. Yeah. Well, that makes no sense. You get my uh, point? Unless you this is what money. Eddie Hearn says. Eddie Hearn says, you can't if go he... to them and say, you know, we can get five times as much or three times as much to fight in Saudi Arabia, but Dave from Rotherham thinks you should do it in England because he's a Brit. And because it's about the fans and it's about giving back, he says, so Dave from Rotherham thinks that you should take, you know, a significant, you know, exorbitant pay cut because for the sake of prestige and what would be seen to be more fitting. Ben, that's like saying we can get more money for reggae sunsplash. Yeah. So we're no longer holding it in Jamaica. Yeah. yeah. We're going to move <laughs> it to Saudi Arabia. Yeah, or maybe maybe to Switzerland. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not a violent person, Ben, but um, if Eddie Hearn take the Joshua fight, Joshua versus Tyson Fury, out of England and take it somewhere else, you guys should not allow him back in the country. Yeah. <laughs> you, you shouldn't. That fight should be a Wembley Stadium, like you said. I think it should be, yeah. And I, and I think that... A lot of fans will be pissed off if it's not because they, you know, you can imagine how many people want to go to it as well. You know, whereas if it's in Saudi Arabia, most of them are not going to go to it, are they? I mean, you get a few people who still go out there. But. Ben, if that fight is not in England, I don't know how you guys would even allow Eddie Hearn to make it back to the country. Um, if they take Reggae Sunsplash out of Jamaica, the original reggae sun splash the promoters and move yeah. it somewhere else. I don't think we would let them back in the country. No. Well, let's, let, let's watch this space, George, and let's see. Let's let's hope it happens somewhere. In any case, you know. I I, I think it will. But this been, you know, it, it's going to be a super fight, as people say. Probably the biggest fight. It's the yeah, biggest history. fight in 2021. Probably the biggest fight in the history of the UK. Um, it's yeah. that big. It is, yeah, it is, certainly, because it, it's, it's an unprecedented... Well, we've had a situation to an extent. I think Lennox Lewis versus Frank Bruno was pretty big, but it's not quite... Mm -hmm. You could say perhaps it didn't have a significance that this has 
No, Bruno was a massive name here. Was a, he's like an institution. But the fact that they are both reigning heavyweight champions, uh, you know, and it's and it is to settle that final question of supremacy, that it that, that gives it a more kind of Ali Fraser type vibe, yes, at least. Yeah. You know, that they they it's that or if Tyson Spinks that once and for all kind of thing. And the fact that it is happening between two Brits is a unique situation yeah. for, for us for us, yeah. How's Frank doing, man? I follow him on Instagram. You know, I was so happy back in the day that when Frank fought Mike Tyson, you know Tyson's dad is Jamaican. Yeah, Percival Davis, right? Or no. His biological <laughs> father. Yeah, Percival Davis is it was it was his biological father who's from from um, in Jamaica. And yeah, yeah. Frank's parents, Frank Bruno, his parents are Jamaican. His mom yes. or his dad, or both of them. Yeah. Yeah. So uh I had my two Jamaican brothers fighting. You know, I, I have to claim all Jamaicans. Uh, yeah. Well, even Floyd has got some Jamaican blood. Yeah, on his mom's side, his uh, yeah. his grandfather. Yeah, that's it. So. Yeah. But uh, but now Frank Bruno seems to be okay for right now. I mean, he's had his he's had his struggles over the years with uh, depression, etc., bipolar. But now, I mean, Frank seems to be okay at the minute, from what I gather. He's um, always well dressed. Yeah, he is. Yeah, he's, I mean, I, I did an interview. I did a night with Frank Bruno back in 2016, where yes. I put the night on and, and sold the tickets for him. We did. We did an interview. It was. It was. It was pretty cool. I, I know you guys love Bruno, man. It's like huge, huge star during his time. I mean, he was. Yeah, I mean, he, he was. So he was. He was what you call a household name. You know, he had that yes. kind of level of. To be the prime minister, the, like John Major, everybody knew Frank Bruno. He was in that top. Three to five yes. most recognizable faces in the country. Yeah, Frank. When you look at Frank, he looks like someone took a chisel and just carved him out. I mean, this guy here, yeah. <laughs> muscles on top of muscles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we were when he first came about. We'd never had that kind of product before. You know, like a, a like say a, a big black chiseled heavyweight. Yeah, who had that kind of potential to. To go as far as he did, so it was it was a new thing because before that we had the likes of Henry Cooper and Joe Bugner and Richard Dunn. So he was aesthetically he was a new product that people were excited about. Yeah, he, was, he was chiseled. I mean, my yeah. God! And I think yeah. you look at Joshua now. I think he's taking off some of the muscles, but another chiseled fighter. Yeah, and, and I think Joshua looks good a little a little trimmer and a little lighter, yeah. so he can move. You know. Now the question. How big was Lennox in the UK? I know he was big. He was born in the UK, went to Canada. He has the only man who claims three countries and he's revered yeah. in all three. How big was well, he in the UK? He's never been revered here because too much of a percentage of the sporting fans population didn't accept him as British because he, one of his stumbling blocks, you know, rightly or wrongly, was he didn't sound British. He had he had a mid-Atlantic accent, which mm -hmm. he probably sounded British to American ears and American to British ears, I imagine, right? People mm -hmm. don't understand that. So he had that kind of mid-Atlantic thing going on. He boxed, it was high profile of winning a gold medal for Canada. So for some people that was a, you know, another yeah. strike against him in terms of, it. Would, some people felt he was here because it suited him. He, he, he identified with Britain for, for reasons of marketability and, uh, and, was the best position from which to launch an assault on world heavyweight boxing okay so a lot of people never thought he was really british they couldn't in the way that ricky hatton is as british as fish and chips right mm -hmm. you know ricky hatton is is british through and through he's northern british you know but um bruno was was seen as eminently british henry cooper years ago before <laughs> that obviously was you know and lennox never kind of embodied that kind of British kind of emblem, really. It just wasn't him. So, even though he was well known and, and, and very admired, and lots of people, boxing people, obviously like him. And very, but even then, there was there was because I know there was a prejudice against him in America that some of the American hard bitten critics still wouldn't accept he was really a great heavyweight. They thought he was just the best of a bad bunch. Mm -hmm. And there's a few boxing fans in like that in Britain too. You know, I think so. Lewis never had the neck of being loved over here because, uh, do you know what? I think he was too good almost because. We like we like our heroes to be a little bit fallible. Not, not me personally, but as a as a in terms of a national character, we do seem to like the lovable losers, you know. He um, Lennox was incredible, man. Just yeah. to see a man with that skill set, 
fast speed, could throw combinations, power. Um, you know, we love him in Jamaica. Yeah, and, it, and that's where he lives. So that's <laughs> we, we love him in Jamaica. Hey, Lennox, yeah. mom was always in his training camp. There's a, have you seen the documentary? There's a good documentary out right now called Lennox it, Thursday, it Old Story. And so, you know, Ben, I, I was working in Jamaica in the 2000s, and uh, my boss was good friends with Lennox. And she said uh, at the golf course, the time in Kingston, the golf course, she would uh, work out in the morning time at the golf course. She said, George, why don't you go jogging? Lennox was on the island. You know, I think yeah. he was still training that time. He said, why don't you go on the golf course? I think this was 2002, uh, one, two, something like that. Yeah, uh, I can arrange it. You and Lennox go jogging in the morning. And Ben, listen to me trying to, I had so much work to do, right? Yeah. We were re-engineering a whole bunch of, I said, no, I got to get to work early. And I missed out a whole week or two weeks. I could have gone jogging with Lennox Lewis. Looking back at it, I feel like an that idiot. That would have been cool. Yeah, I'm like, there's so many of those things where, oh, I should have done this, but I yeah. didn't do it. But yeah. he's a real cool guy. Um, he has uh, the League of Champions in Jamaica. He built a complex down there. He has one in Canada and one in the UK. And Brian Jennings, contender from Philadelphia, yeah. went a year ago, two years ago, I think it's summer of uh, 2018, to help out at Lennox Camp. So I asked, I said, Brian, can you get a shirt from the champ for me? So he got a t-shirt, League of Champions. So I have one of Lennox's t-shirts. Cool. <laughs> yeah. And Spencer, Spencer knows it pretty well. But... Nah, gr great fighter, man. Great fighter. Um, I look back at his his fight tapes and um, he had it all. Yeah, he did. Definitely and the thing is, I think he would, he would take a lot of beating uh, in any era. You know, and I think there's only from the head-to-head -head aspect. I think you've got to rate him in there like the top four or five, you know, because I think he's, in terms of who beats who and beats who, A beats B beats C, Lennox comes out pretty high in all of that. Uh, he had it all, a great skill set. Really yeah. a great skill set. And to see a man 6'5", 250, um, with a jab like that, threw a really great uppercut, good left foot, good right hand, um, very talented. Got to give it to yeah. him. Very talented. For sure. And, and the thing I love about him is he got out at the right time. He didn't hang around too too long. If anything, he had a perfect life and career, really, because, let's say, he avenged both of his losses. He got out just at the right time when it was yeah. right it was on the wall, but he still he still went out on a win, a very legitimate win. And, and you know, yeah. the, hell with anybody, the hell with anybody who says that Klitschko should have won that fight. Klitschko got his face beaten off halfway through. Yeah. That's, that's called a legitimate TKO loss. End the story, and no, Lewis didn't owe him anything. Didn't owe him a rematch. Didn't owe him anything at all. Made the right call. Walked away yeah. to the sunset. Then he had his family and started to, you know, father children. And uh, yes. you know, if you if you were looking at a fighter who didn't really put a foot wrong hardly, it'd be Lennox Lewis. I would say Lennox. Uh, I love the fighters that they got out at the right time. Uh, yeah. Lennox Lewis. I love the fact that your nemesis, the man who's going to be for you, Hagler, Hagler got out. Right before he turned 33. Yep. Um, Gene Tunney, going way yes. back. Yes. Rocky Marciano, of course. Of course, yep. But certain fighters did. And um, Kostya Zou didn't overstay his welcome either. You know, I admire guys who can lose at that top level and be like, you know what, it's time to go. The ones who sink back into the opponent level and end up fighting, losing to guys who couldn't lace their shoes, I understand that. And everybody needs to eat and live. And they've, they've got their own journey. But it's a shame, isn't it? You know. Uh, and Floyd, we, we forgot Floyd. Floyd Mayweather. Floyd, yeah, and it's very, it's relatively rare. Kawasaki, Kawasaki is another one. Kawasaki too. You're right. But, but but there ain't too many. I mean, we, we could we could probably name about twenty in history, maybe. You know. I don't know most if we can really find on. twenty, Ben. Probably a good twelve. Yeah, most <laughs> fighters go on too long. They they pack, they they outlive their you know their their sell by date because it's not about being past your prime. It's about being you know way past your prime. And, and, you know, I was watching uh, Canelo the other night. And he's 30 years old. Yeah. He's been a professional for 15 years. Yeah. And I said to someone, I hope he gets out in the next two years. He's made a lot of money. 
He's won titles in four weight divisions. He's definitely going to the Hall of Fame. Yeah. But I would hate to see Canelo. He's he's in his prime right now. Right yeah. now. And I believe after 32, his skill will start. He'll start to slow down. So I'm yeah. praying that he retires at 32 years old at the latest. Don't hang around. You don't need the money. No, nah, he, he, he should do that. But, you know, I remember Oscar De La Hoya, or I remember Bob Arum saying of Oscar De La Hoya, He's not gonna. He won't still be fighting when he's thirty. He's not. That's not the plan. But obviously, De La Hoya carried on and got to a point when he was a shell of himself and got beat up by Pacquiao, which you know wouldn't have happened when he was. Happened. You know, so the best laid plans, as it were. You know, that I've I've heard it said before that this guy will get out at the right time. He'll be too smart. He'll he'll get out at the top. And for one reason or another, so many fighters don't seem to do that. And the one I'm looking at right now. Manny Pacquiao, why are you still fighting at, what is he now, 42? 41, I believe, yeah. 41, 42, you've made more money than 99% of boxers in the history of boxing. Yeah. You've won so many world titles. How many weight divisions? Seven, eight weight division? Yeah. <laughs> it's incredible. You're a politician. You're revered all over the world. Why do you want to still get hit in the head? It's strange, isn't it? But I guess he just, for some of these guys, and maybe Manny is one of them, it's just the ultimate definition of who they are. And it's so hard to turn their back on. I mean, that's one thing. For myself, as much as I love boxing, as much as I love the physical side of, of, of sparring and stuff, I think if I had the, the things you just described, the legacy and the money and the status that Manny Pacquiao's got, I don't think I'd have a hard time walking away at his age. I, right. I can't see it. But but he must he must be of some different mindset where he just he still needs it in his life. Who could you know who could say? I mean Duran, I know he didn't make the money that Pacquiao has, uh, but Duran had to have a car crash before he could prevent him from fighting, yeah. didn't he? You know, yeah. he literally had to have that decision made for him, he had to have it taken away from him. It was never gonna stop of his own accord. And maybe you know, Holyfield was kind of like that. Um mm -hmm. you know, um and he's even been looking at ways he could get back in the ring in recent years with, under some kind of exhibition guys. So some of them, it, it does seem to be that addiction, you know? I think people should have well-rounded lives, but um, the whole idea when people get into boxing is to win a world title and you hope you make a lot of money. These guys have accomplished so much, but they hang around. One punch can change a fight, change the course yeah. of your entire life. It can, yeah. But they... I, you know, a lot, a lot of people said Floyd Mayweather won't stay retired, and I'm praying that he stays retired through your exhibitions, but I don't want to see Floyd get knocked out or fighting somebody because a young fighter, you can't beat father time, and it just takes one punch. Yeah, for sure. And I, I hate to see great fighters um, who you revere, and you saw them at their peak and you just see them at 30% or 40% of themselves. And you know that they're no longer what they used to be, but they don't know it. Well, do you know what? You say they don't know. I think they do. Barry McGuigan nailed this one for me years ago when he said, mm -hmm. they always say a fighter is the last one to know when he hasn't got any more. McGuigan said, nonsense. You're the first one to know. You're just the last one to accept it. And, that, and, and that's probably the dilemma, Ben. We still believe... We rem fighters remember themselves at yeah. their highest peak. Yeah, and no doubt when they when they suddenly find them, they're getting nailed in sparring and they're struggling with guys they shouldn't be struggling with. I guess they think it's just a bad day or just off day. You know, and they think I'll get it back. You know, I'll be on song or maybe they've probably come up with a thousand excuses to why it wasn't working, and they'll be different next time. Yep. Well, Ben, this has been a good one. I know we wanted to, you know, I, I spent all day trying to come up with a name for Spencer Ferron. Um, we already call you the Barristow Boxer. Well, you know, he's got his name right. They call him the Knowledge. Or, well, I was he, going to call him the, the Swingali of the Sweet Science. Yeah. But I know Master Knowledge is his... Uh, yes, his handle, yeah. He was, he was dubbed the Knowledge by Coogan Cassius of IFL TV. Okay, and then we're going to use that. Yeah. 
and then and then yeah, and then then he changed his master knowledge on Twitter because he couldn't have the knowledge. So yeah. Okay, but it's the knowledge. Yeah, that's him. Let's try and okay. get it tomorrow. Let, let's hope so. If not, we have uh my God, it's been a good conversation. Either so, way, yeah, either way. What I'll do, I will let you know as soon as I know in the morning. It's getting on for midnight here, I guess. So when I get up in the morning, I will confirm with him and I'll send you a message as soon as I know if we're on for seven o'clock, okay? Well, this has been a good conversation. Time. We're going to post this anyway. So, yeah, man. Thanks Dude. again, Ben. It's been good, man. Um, here's a gentleman on uh, on uh, Facebook, Mark. How you spell it? Caroline? Or Caroline, something? yeah. Uh, Caroline. Caroline, yeah. Very good let, let me wife. say this, and let me give a shout out to Mark Caroline. He's in, he's in uh, England, right? He, he lives in London. He's a very good friend of mine. He's a, a real friend of mine. He's a good friend of yours. Yeah. I've been in touch with Mark all these years on Facebook, and you know the idea of us doing one of these interviews, that was Mark's idea. Okay, cool. Yeah. It was, uh, yeah. <laughs> it was yeah. Mark's idea. Mark said it a while back, so yeah, it's no, stuck. So Mark, Mark's a big boxing fan. He's undefeated in one white collar fight. He had one white collar fight. He won it, then he walked away from the game, just like we were talking about. He says there's no blueprint to beat him because he's 1-0. Uh, the man won 100% of his fights, man. He's not 1-0. Yeah. He won a, yeah. 100%. He was tired on the feet of life. Too. Yeah, exactly. But, but exactly. this idea came from Mark, and just the idea to get Spencer, man. Um, just get off yeah. here to just talk about For sure. I, 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 as soon as I get, get up tomorrow, I will... I will, I will firm him up one way or the other and I'll let you know as soon as I know. And shout out to Mark. Mark, this was your idea. Thank you, my brother. We appreciate it. Cheers. Take care, man. Okay. Talk to you tomorrow. Talk tomorrow. Cheers. Thanks, sir. Cheers, George.